We will now turn to our final speakers on proposition. Mikdad Versi. Mikdad is the founder of the Centre for Media Monitoring at the Muslim Council of Britain. He is passionately and constructively engaged with media outlets over the misrepresentation of Muslims, with The Guardian describing as the UK's one-man Islamophobia media monitor. Mikdad, you have the floor. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, the motion that we're talking about is all about accountability and power. And we've heard a lot about the need for free speech. Right at the beginning, Jake, you talked about the value of unabashed free speech with very, very little accountability. That is the core of what you're arguing. And I agree to some extent that we need a free press. In fact, I'd go even further and say we need a powerful press. We need a powerful press who can hold governments to account. We need a powerful press to expose unfairness. We need a powerful press to shed light on injustice. And I'd even go even further. I'd say, as you said earlier, that the press needs to be able to make mistakes and deal with those mistakes. But does there need to be unabashed free speech without any accountability? Should the press have, and I'm gonna be very specific here, should the press have the power as it currently has to discriminate against groups, to spread hateful lies about communities and minorities without accountability at all? Now, I'm gonna talk about one example that's not necessarily relevant to the UK first, just to give an idea of why this is so problematic. Just look what happened in Rwanda. Now, it may not be close to us. Not everyone knows about what's happened in Rwanda. But in 1994, the news media played a crucial role in the genocide there. According to the International Development Research Center and many, many others, local media fueled the killings. Murders on the ground. Not one, not two, but a genocide. Local media were instrumental in that genocide. Is that okay? No one will say it's okay. I know that you aren't either. Okay? <laughs> but, but what we're talking about here is a consequence that can happen without accountability. Let's not forget that there needs to be some level of accountability. We cannot ignore that. Um, not right now, sorry. And, and so look, I, I'm not saying that the UK press, and this is not just about the UK press, but I'm not saying that our press here have reached that level of sharing hate. I'm not saying that. But there needs to be some level of accountability. So that's what I want to focus on here. Because I'm going to argue that too often the press is caught lying. Too often the press is lying. Too often the press engages in racism. Too often the, the press engages in Islamophobia. And too often the press does the bidding of the strong and attacks the weak. And the question to ponder is, should there be a level of accountability on this? And we all know how certain news outlets seem to have a license to put out lies and misrepresentations at will and with impunity. And I'm going to talk about examples related to Muslims, because that's an area that I know relatively well. I'm someone who have had more corrections at national newspapers than many others out there. Over 100 news stories have changed because of, um, of complaints that I've made or the, te the team that we have founded made. So I I'm talking from a level of authority. The Sun had a front page story saying that one in five Brit Muslims sympathy with jihadis with a picture of a terrorist on its front page associating ordinary British Muslims with terrorism. It was a lie on the front page of the newspaper fueling hate against Muslims. Is that okay? Should there be some accountability? Now, some may argue, for those who know, that the press regulator, this brilliant press regulator out there, was forced to come into action and they had a correction on page two in small writing on the side. Is that accountability after a front page story lying about Muslims? Is that really okay? The Times had a front page story saying that Muslims were silent on terror. Can you imagine what, what, what goes through people's minds when this happens? The Muslims are silent on terror. The evidence is the opposite. No, not right now, sorry. So the reality is there is a willingness for many national newspapers not only to pay, play to the worst prejudices of our society, but to fuel it. Some, and not all, want to create and nurture this idea of an evil Muslim. That's why the Mail, for example, had, an, had lied in a headline saying that more than 50 million Muslims are willing to support those who carry out terror attacks. 
You could say maybe they have a right to lie about Muslims. It's, only, it's okay to punch down against a minority where half, of those com half in that community live in the most deprived areas in this country. You might say that sometimes at least the, the stories are changed after the fact. Although that's rarely with equal prominence to the original lie in the first place. And, not, and very rarely is it in a way that can be shared in the same way as the original lie was. But is this really enough accountability? Let's consider a few more examples. Let's take a story in the sun. The headline was, supermarket terror, gunman screaming Allahu Akbar, opens fire in a Spanish supermarket. Was this true? Actually, it was a Basque separatist who probably didn't know any Arabic, did not shout Allahu Akbar. The sun did acknowledge its error after I pointed it out to them. Um, when it, but when they found out, just, just on a side point, when they realized it wasn't a, a Muslim, they changed it from supermarket terror to supermarket horror. Because guess what? Um, white dudes can't commit terrorism, can they? Um, so should there be no accountability when there are these lies that come out? Now, you could say, oh, these are just lies. Let, let's go a, a bit further. Let's talk about the racism, the discrimination, and Islamophobia of the powerful uh, attacking the weak. Sorry, give me a few minutes, sorry. Let, let me, let, let's look at Rod Liddell, who wrote about Muslim savages, who talked about a significant proportion of Muslims living in Europe hating us and wanting us dead. Talking about shutting every Islamic school and about the Muslims being anti-Jewish. Let's say, let, let's talk about the fact that he said that there was not nearly enough Islamophobia in the Conservative Party. Let's talk about how Lidl wanted there to disenfranchise Muslims. Let's talk about how Lidl said, I don't really mind if they don't leave this, if they don't leave this country, so long as they blow themselves up somewhere, a decent distance from where the rest of us live. Tower Hamlets, for example. Just imagine this is the type of almost incitement to violence, or although a joke, when it comes at the expense of minorities and Muslims. Is he just an exception? Let's talk about Melanie Phillips. When she said in the Times, having been, and she said lots of things in the Times and other places, having been inculcated with the unchallengeable belief that they are victims of white society, black people believe that any disadvantage they, they suffer must be the product of white racism. Is that what all black people believe? Can you put that racism in the press? The Times, just for, for, for information, decided to surreptitiously change that to try and, um, without, without even acknowledging their change. So, and the Times is a serial offender at this. You might recall how it had four front pages in a week centering around a Christian child forced into Muslim foster care, a story riddled with lies, inaccuracies, and it partially apologized for part of it. And I could literally spend hours, and I mean hours because I do this, and, I, and my team does this on a regular basis, um, talking about example after example. We've collated these at the Muslim Council of Britain Center for Media Monitoring. We've studied them. We've seen how, how wide they, they run. I'll run out of time. So let me get to the crux of the matter. So you may think, does this matter? Does it matter if the press um, publishes racism, bigotry, and Islamophobia to fuel the hatred of others about Muslims or about any minority? It really does. Not only because these articles contribute to a rising hostility towards British Muslims, according to academics at this institution. Not only because, according to the University of Leicester, they fuel hate crime in Britain, but also because they give credence to the far right. The leader of Britain first shared the Times story that I talked about earlier, as did Tommy Robinson, as did the English Defence League. So when it comes to social media, they are often sharing these very institutions' work. Sorry, no. So let, let's come to the motion. We're talking about the press having too much power. We've seen examples of that power talked about today. We definitely need more democratization, more newspaper outlets, more responsible free speech. And what we have right now is a media at the hands of oligarchs, and there are many challenges when it comes to the, the way the media and, 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 and governments work. But we, we need more accountability. And one point was raised, saying, what's the alternative? I think the lady over there raised it. Well, there are countries around the world. We don't need to just look at ourselves. There are countries around the world, such as Ireland, where they have a higher ranking on the World Press Freedom Index, and they have a regulator which has certain protections in place, far more so than here, including, for example, um, the, the idea of, uh, uh, to limit discrimination against groups. That is an example of something which is in the press regulatory requirements in places like Ireland, and they have a higher level of freedom of the press than here. So it's possible 
Let's not pretend it's not possible. It is really possible. We have that in many institutions. So we shouldn't just say that the US and UK are the bastions of free democracy and nowhere else we can, are, are good enough. That's not the case. There are examples that we can have. And the problem is that our press regulator here doesn't have an issue with discrimination, doesn't care about these, these items. So this idea that it's a, a, robust discriminatory, a robust regime against discrimination is just not true. Let, let, let's look, at, for example, at how Katie Hopkins um, used dehumanizing language in the sun, calling migrants cockroaches. What do you do with cockroach, cockroaches? You stamp on them. You destroy them. That's what she's talking about, about migrants. It's close enough to incitement to violence. But guess what? Press regulator, oh, it's fine. Is that, is that what we're talking about when it comes to accountability? The press regulator thought there was no problem when actually one of its own board members, or former board members, used Nazi-like terminology about Muslims. He said, what will we do about the Muslim problem? We've all heard about the Jewish problem. The Muslim problem was, in capitalization, was used by a former board member of this so-called regulator. Thousands and thousands of complaints have gone to this so-called robust regulator on discrimination, and only one of them has been upheld. Is this really accountability? The former Conservative Party chair, the most, one of the most senior Muslims in the country, said that recent headlines about Muslims echoed those about Jewish people in the 1930s, gay people in the 1950s, and Irish Catholics in the 1980s. That's what she said. So if you think that maybe the press might have too much power and needs a little bit more accountability for some of the excesses that I've talked about today, then you must side with this side of the House. I urge you to vote for the motion. Thank you very much. <laughs>